Some view it as a necessary measure of last resort. Others call it torture. As the province considers recommendations for reforming the use of solitary confinement, we wanted to hear from some of those who know the system best to get their take on improving it. And to that end, let's welcome, in New York, New York, Lisa Kerr, Assistant Professor at Queen's University's Faculty of Law. And here in our studio, Monty Wieselmeyer, Chair of Corrections Division of OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, and Lee Chappelle, President, Canadian Prison Consulting, Inc., and a former inmate who has spent time in solitary confinement. Uh, I'll say welcome back to everybody because we've uh, had you on this program before discussing this very issue. And I want to start by showing everybody. Lee, take a look at this picture and see if this looks familiar to you. Because this is from the Niagara Detention Center. It's a small room. You spent two years on and off mm -hmm. in provincial and federal solitary during your 20 years in prison. Does that room look familiar? It does. It what does. was being in solitary like? It's so difficult to capture, I think, for, for anybody to really have a feel for it. Um, well, let's start there. What's the longest amount of time you were in? The longest stretch I spent in, in the hole, as, as inmates uh, tend to call it, was approximately three to four months, about 100 days. And that meant inside that room for how long and outside that room for how long? It varies. Provincially, I think uh, yard time and out time is, is, is more limited than federally. Federally, there seems to be a little bit more of a consistency to uh, maybe a half hour out a day. More often than not, I would say in the federal system, you'd end up with minimally four or five days of half an hour yard, every other day shower. Uh, and that's the extent of out time. In provincial, I would say often it was, I was fortunate uh, to have a day of yard. We heard Howard Saper say it's soul destroying. Was that your experience? It's a challenge. There's no question about it. For for me, I I can say that I was one of the the fortunate I think abilities that I was able to have was that I understood this would come to an end. I was very rarely in an indefinite term. Um, but ultimately, it is a real challenge. A lot of pacing, a lot of push-ups, a lot of, um, you know, just endless, long, long days that, that seem like an eternity. And often, no gauge whether it's day or night or, or no, no, no natural light. So you had no window? No. You, I'm told you often considered running headfirst into a wall trying to knock yourself out. Yeah. How come? Well, you'd sleep to the point, I mean, for me, I would sleep as much as I possibly could. And then you come to a point where you just couldn't sleep anymore and you'd have bed sores and, and it was you know, far from comfortable. And, and yeah, you, it, the frustration level at times would, would hit a point where, where I contemplated doing so. Thinking that I would at least have, uh, you know, if I was knocked out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be feeling what I was feeling. Why did you get put in a solitary in the first place? Well, the longest stint for me was for making alcohol in Melhaven um, Penitentiary, and typically that was a seven-day sentence. It was a very straightforward disciplinary segregation. Melhaven was going through a, re a retrofit at the time, and my cell was taken while I was in the hole. Uh, I was coming up on a release date, a statutory release date, so essentially I just ended up writing out the balance of my three or four months in the hole in an administrative seg, which is, was pretty much an aberration in that time. It was 1990. So it wasn't for your own protection or it wasn't to punish you or...? It wasn't. It was just a matter of, of logistics. And I guess last question before we get everybody else in here. Trying to reintegrate into the general population of a facility after you've been in solitary, what's that like? It's challenging. Um, it's, it's a very difficult process. When you first come out, it's, it's surreal. Uh, you feel like it's a dreamlike... Um, Difficult to to take in, and again, coming that's a great point. Coming into mainstream population from solitary is very challenging. In in the case where I spent the hundred days, I was released directly to the street, and and it was a failed release. In retrospect, I don't think I would have. You know, anybody who's being released from solitary, I think, has, stands very little chance of not reoffending or doing. You know not doing well. Too tough a transition. Uh, well, it's certainly not rehabilitative in nature. Um, and it's a real challenge coming back into mainstream population, never mind released directly to the street. Monty, let me get your understanding of this experience because, and I'm going to use the correct terminology this time, <laughs> not prison guard, but you were a correctional officer working in segregation. Six years? Correct. Okay. From your vantage point, what did you see? Well, obviously I saw it from the, the other side uh, than Lee. 
Uh, and I worked my six years at the Toronto West Detention Centre in segregation. And you had a, a variety of the population. So there it could be for disciplinary reasons, it could be for mental health, for medical. So you had to be flexible in your ability to supervise and manage that population. Uh, so again, uh, dealt with those challenges the best you could. Did I have appropriate training to deal with mental health issues and so on? No, a lot of it that was lived experience, how to uh, better effectively uh, deal with these individuals. And uh, for the most part, you dealt with them for short periods of time, and then they're rotating back in into the general population or another portion of the jail, and then you're getting a new individual. So you had to be flexible in your ability to do that. For those who were in for a long period of time, let's say more than the, the 15 days that Howard Sapers is recommending we do going forward, what did you notice that in terms of the emotional or intellectual or health impact on the person who would have been in solitary for more than 15 days? And again, that's an individual aspect. Uh, some people, uh, you know, after a couple of days, they're like, you know, they, they refer to us as boss. Like, you got to get me out of here. And they would be, uh, you know, already sh showing signs. And where others, uh, you know, uh, they could do long periods or stretches of time in there and would hardly have any effect on them. Uh, we did have some long-term uh, individuals that uh, were under uh, um, the federal legislation regards to uh, security certificates that spent years in there. And, uh, you know, there was different challenges uh, in that regard. Uh, but again, it was individualized and you tried to manage as best you could. Uh, Any traumatic experiences for you while you were doing this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, one, uh, in uh, regards to mental health, because we were fortunate at Toronto West, we actually had uh, a unit where we could uh, move individuals to quite often because we were one of the few institutions that had a mental health unit, um, we, would, we wouldn't have enough bed space to move them. So they would come to segregation until, uh, uh, say, a bed would open up so we could assess them properly or, uh, or integrate them with other uh, individuals with mental health issues. Uh, an individual for <clears throat> two weeks basically was asking uh, to get moved to that unit, and I'd come in on my shift, an afternoon shift. I'm, you know, I'm talking to the manager. I'm trying to get you moved. And one day I came in. And that individual, or basically I said there was a death in segregation, so I went into the unit and it happened to be that same individual I've been talking to for the last two weeks had passed away. He was a young man in his mid-20s. How? Uh, well, when they did the autopsy, he had a brain aneurysm. But uh, what happened was when the, they came uh, to medically deal with him, they worked on to try to save his life, but he passed away. So the, they left his body in the corridor for four hours while, until the coroner came to pick him up. And I had to walk past his body when uncovered, there was, you know, and still check on the other inmates I had in segregation. So that has an impact on you, absolutely. Lisa, let's get you into this discussion here. And I wonder if you could tell us from your legal vantage point, uh, what you believe to be the advisability of using segregation in our justice system. Well, I think the big issue in Canada right now and, and in this report that's come out in Ontario is that the current law, whether it's the federal law or the provincial law in Ontario, really lacks clear standards and rules uh, for this practice. So it may be that separating inmates from one another or separating inmates from the general population uh, is justified at times for very short periods. That should be a practice that's closely regulated, subject to strict limits and oversight. And right now, in both our federal and provincial systems, we really are lacking those legal safeguards. Are you content with the, uh, I guess, uh, limit that Howard Sapers has recommended, namely 15 days and no more for segregation? So that's a limit that, as, as Mr. Sapers described, comes out of an international consensus that has emerged. That consensus is based on medical research, psychological studies, and so on, about how if segregation extends beyond 15 days, it can cause harm to at least a significant portion of, of people. And of course, that depends on uh, who they are when they're segregated and what kinds of challenges they had at that time. Um, yeah, it, it would be a big step forward. Uh, both in the federal and provincial systems to have a limit like that on administrative segregation, not just disciplinary segregation. The Ontario government has already agreed to a 15-day limit on disciplinary segregation, but we need that same limit across the board in order for it to be meaningful. And just so I'm clear, are you acknowledging that there is a time and a place where segregation is appropriate? 
So I think there's an important distinction to make between separation and isolation. So separating inmates from, from a population or from a particular um, you know, program or another inmate they're having difficulties with, that's one thing. Isolating an inmate in a cell for 22, 23 hours a day, that's the kind of practice that, uh, number one, we need to improve conditions of confinement, even if it's for just 15 days, and then we need to make sure it doesn't extend beyond 15 days. So, you know, it, this report, you know, just to take one example, it talks about how right now in Ontario, inmates who are segregated are only getting 20 minutes of fresh air a day. Now, it's not set out in legislation, it's kind of buried in a policy that you can punish an inmate who's committed misconduct by limiting their fresh air to 20 minutes a day. Well, what Mr. Sabres described is how that's the only mention of that topic, and that has actually settled into the norm for all segregated inmates, that they only get 20 minutes of fresh air a day, and sometimes they're not even getting that if staffing and routines prevent it. So it's things like that. You know, there shouldn't be a single day where any human being in a Canadian correctional facility gets only 20 minutes a day of fresh air, in my view. And one more follow-up, Lisa. D is it your view as well that this has become, segregation I'm saying, um, too often a, the sort of go-to tool for corrections officers to use when they have problems with an inmate? Is that your view? It is my view. I, I mean, it, it has become a default tool for managing a range of problems. And those problems range from, you know, uh, very serious to, to, to not serious at all. Um, and so, and it's interesting, if we look at the federal system, uh, for, for three decades, reformers were trying to convince the Correctional Service of Canada to reduce its practice of administrative segregation and to agree to legal reforms. They said they absolutely couldn't do it, that it would be too risky for their staff, that they needed to use it in exactly the same way they were using it for, for three decades. Well, in the last two years, they managed to cut their reliance on administrative segregation in half. They've reduced their daily counts from something like 800 people in segregation to 400. Why did that happen? Well, because of uh, media pressure, because of deaths in custody, because of of uh, independent investigations and reports. And uh, so it shows us that um, the practice had been overused for many years and that with a change in corporate focus and a change in culture, that the federal prison service could vastly reduce its reliance on segregation. Monty, I need to get you to come in on that. Do you think segregation has been used too often as the so-called go-to tool for corrections officers? Um, well, it's a necessary tool, uh, for sure. Uh, we obviously have limitations that Mr. Saper speaks to in his report, whether the age of the facility and the structural aspect. It would be great to have, uh, you know, another unit where we could uh, put an individual where they may have more time out of cell, but we have structural uh, deficiencies that we just don't have that uh, ability. And plus, when you put capacity pressures, you know, many of our facilities, 100% or greater, uh, you can only move, you know, one individual from one box into, into the next box. You don't have those abilities to do that. So. Lee, when you were inside, did it seem to you that the use of segregation was overdone, used willy-nilly, without care or advisability? Well, I have a span that dates back to the mid-80s and up till 2010 from, from personal experience. I would say that it wasn't occurring in the mid 80s and the 90s to the extent that it has over the past 10 to 15 years, and there's a number of reasons for that. Well, we, we've showed charts to that effect already. We do know it's higher now right. than yeah. it has been. Yeah. The, you know, infrastructure changes in Ontario in the late 90s, uh, early 2000. Um, we went to super jail, modeled, uh, American modeled uh, provincial jails. There has been, uh, at the same time, we had a tough on crime regime from our federal government, so, so it compounded matters into overcrowding. Now, part of the premise of the infrastructure for the super jails, as they're called, uh, centralized, was to save money and to require less staffing because they had so much security levels, and they're all super maximum security places. And one of the issues for this, I think, for me, from my perspective, when you look at Ontario Provincial Corrections, they're facing considerable strain and challenge day in and day out on the front lines. However, we have, and most people don't understand this, it's, it's much more secure than the federal penitentiaries. It's super maximum across the board from vagrancy, DUI, to gangs, to murders. I mean, everybody mixed together and all under super maximum conditions, including immigration people who are not even charged with an offense. But is it your view that, that the use of, of solitary confinement is now out of control? 
I would say, yeah, I'd say it's definitely become a default uh, position. And I think, in, and again, the challenges that, 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 that they're facing, I, I think what you need to do to get ahead of it, it in my belief, is all in, in, in intake. Uh, and that is creating, I believe, with the infrastructure in place, we could have reception centers in every one of our Ontario jails that for a two-week period that could filter people, that could put them in compatible areas. We could come up with protective custody ranges as opposed to administrative segregation. Mm -hmm. And I also believe we really need to implement electronic health records in all 26 of our jails hmm. um, because there's a there's a ton of issues that have arose from I do notice there we go Sheldon's got the wide shot up you've got a lot of paper on the table there what is all this I do and, and I want to point to this because this is over the last five or six years these are all the reports reviews and recommendations that have been done for Ontario corrections and so we start with the code in 2013 that was uh, based upon excessive force we have a Merck report from what was called the Bob Cook health care report following the birth okay Lee you don't have to take us through every single <laughs> report but I think there's a bottom line here which is have 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 any have have governments moved on these reports having asked for them in the first place well I think see there's a real disconnect and this is I think where the real issue lies so we have I, th I agree legislative change legislation is good as it stands for the most part there's some things that need solidifying I believe in regards to time for segregation um, but for the most part our legislation is solid now it's it's the implementation thereof mm -hmm. and I think when we have tweaks as we have from most of these reports and recommendations and then there's a memo put out to everybody that's working on the front lines and what happens is the people on the front lines essentially roll their eyes and say you have no idea what it's like in here and to a certain extent they're right it, okay. it, it's so there's a there needs to be better communication and, and more of a sense of what's doable and what's achievable and i think fundamental change as opposed to tweaking legislation. Well, again, okay, and Lisa, let me bring you in at this point, and, and let me ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, first of all, to bring up graphic number two here as we consider whether this is as big a problem as the critics say it is. And to that end, let's look at the length of segregation. These are figures for last year. 70% of the stays in segregation were seven days or fewer, and that comes within the 15-day limit that Howard Sapers is recommending. Then you've got 13 plus at 8 to 14 days. Again, so we've got, add them up, 83% of the length of stays in segregation are within the prescribed limits recommended. Now's where you get, you know, 8%, 15 to 29 days, 6 plus percent, 1 to 3 months, 1.6%, 3 to 6 months, a half a percent, 6 to 12 months, and 0.2% are more than a year in segregation. So the question, I guess, for you, Lisa, is, given that the vast, vast majority are taking place within the recommended allowance, is this as big a problem as some critics think it is? So that data is very useful, and I think that what it shows us is that implementing time limits actually won't interfere that extensively with what correctional officers are already doing. It also shows us that correctional staff are often committed to getting individuals out of segregation as quickly as possible. Um, and that makes sense, right, because they see the harm firsthand that it inflicts on people. So I think it shows us we can do these reforms. We can have these uh, time limits uh, enshrined in legislation. Um, what I think corrections might have a harder time with is um, the cumulative uh, number of days in segregation um, in the course of a year. So this report recommends a 60-day total cap. So that means in a single year, an inmate can't spend more than 60 days. And there are large numbers, I think the number is 1,300 of folks who do spend more than 60 days in a year. That cap could be a little bit more difficult. Um, now, there is an exception, right, that, that is built into these proposed recommendations, which is that if you do need to exceed these time limits, um, you can uh, get consent of the minister. So there's, for example, I think something like 22 inmates that have been held for longer than a year um, in Ontario jails in the past year. And for those 22 inmates, uh, corrections would have to go to the minister and put forward its case for segregating that inmate. And it may be that there is, you know, this small number of inmates um, where it really is impossible to manage them in any other way. And what we should focus on with them is improving conditions of confinement and segregation. Okay, a couple of follow-ups from that to you, Monty. First of all, what's the longest you have heard in your experience of somebody being in solitary confinement? Again, I had mentioned in regards to the federal security certificates, uh, and that was after 9-11. Uh, 
at, uh, we had several of those individuals for multiple years. So this yeah. is a suspected terrorist you're talking about? Yes. And they would have been multiple years in solitary? Correct. Out for anywhere from a half an hour to an hour or something a day? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that was brought up about this 20-minute fresh air, that is the standard for all inmates. So that's not just segregation. Mm -hmm. That's for uh, our general population. And, and that came into effect more of, uh, from a government aspect. Uh, uh, and again, uh, this is a cost-saving aspect. If we reduce the amount of time, we need to reduce staff to actually do that, that aspect. Because there was a time where we used to have uh, the inmates out for an hour at a time. Uh, in segregation, because it's a very busy area, it's difficult to, to get them out for even short periods of weather for uh, fresh air or shower or so on. Um, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Sapers addresses some of that in his report. Can I get you as well to comment on Lisa's point, which again, from this last graph we showed, if 83% of the cases are essentially under that 15-day suggested limit that Howard Sapers put forward, and therefore, I'm doing the quick math here, eight, six, like 15% then are, are uh, over that limit. Mm -hmm. uh, do we infer from that that you guys actually can live within that 15-day limit for the most part? Um, again, uh, as uh, Lisa mentioned, there's 22 individuals uh, that, and there's some, um, we have to have an ability to manage a population. There's, you know, a uh, small percentage of population is very difficult for us to manage. What are our uh, uh, resources to manage them? Uh, one of the things I've had concerns about uh, this report and also the Ombudsman's report that came out just previously is what they uh, refer to alternatives to segregation. Most of what we're talking about is reduction in basically not having individuals with mental health needs or medical needs or those aspects. But when you have an individual that's uh, a challenge, what is it the alternative if you don't put them in segregation, whether for 15 or a, that 60 day cap? What is the alternative? I do not see any alternatives in this report or the Ombudsman's report. Hmm. Lee, can I get a sense from you about when you were in solitary what did you have to do to get yourself out of solitary? Well, for me, it was typically, it was always disciplinary. Um, there was a few exceptions in Ontario jails towards the end of my sentence where I'd come in, I, would, I was prohibited from having my, my medication and uh, I was put in, in solitary because I was told, you know, the institution give, didn't provide that type of medication. And, um, medication for what? Well, for me, I have um, uh, a case where I broke my back and, and cracked vertebrae, nerves trapped in my spine, and I so you and need I have, painkillers. I do, and this is obviously a very taboo subject. And there, there is subhuman things that do happen within our jails and prisons um, when it comes to medication. But but ultimately, it was all it was outright denied. Uh, one of those times, a transfer from the federal system where my medication was intact, my medical file came with me and I arrived in provincial and I was just thrown in the hole and told, no, you're, you're not getting that. So I presume in order for you to get out of the hole, you had to, over what period of time, demonstrate that you were no longer a risk? Well, it wasn't even an issue of being a risk or non-risk. Essentially for me, it was just I had to wait to be transferred back to the federal system. Hmm. See, there's a difference there. In the federal system, you have inmate bodies that are inmate committees and you have the ability to kind of reason and a complaint system in place and, 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 and just a little more ability to, let's say, lobby your case. Provincially, you don't have any of that. Lisa, you are um, obviously as a, as a legal specialist working on the constitutional angle on this thing and I wonder if you could give us uh, some sense, uh, having looked at this, of what you believe, uh, at what point segregation becomes unconstitutional in this province and or country. So it's interesting, there have been a lot of cases recently uh, that raise segregation in one way or another, but we haven't seen in Canada a comprehensive charter-based challenge with a full expert evidentiary record um, on this practice of solitary confinement or administrative segregation. Um, so there's been cases filed now in the last few years, and, and one that's really significant in my view is coming out of British Columbia. It's filed by the BC Civil Liberties Association and the John Howard Society of Canada. And there's multiple charter claims in that case, but it's basically saying that this is a practice that is unconstitutional in, in, from multiple angles, actually not just cruel and unusual punishment, but sort of violating equality norms and violating the rights to security of the person and liberty that convicted people retain um, while they're incarcerated. And so that case is, is quickly actually moving to hearing and, um, 
And that could, uh, and in my, in my prediction, will generate a ruling that the practice in its current form, both federally and in our provinces, uh, violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Is that to say that there are no circumstances, in your view, when segregation is, accept is constitutional? So the way the legal claim would work, and so that the case in BC is a challenge to the federal law, and what it says is that the current legislative provisions in the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, which in my view are actually much better than what's in the Ontario legislation right now, um, that those provisions are unconstitutional because they lack time limits, because they don't prohibit the placement of seriously mentally ill people in segregation, because they have no independent oversight over decisions. So if, if that case wins or succeeds, um, the judge would declare those legislative provisions to be unconstitutional, and then it would be Parliament's job to redraft the law in accordance with the problems that the court identifies. So, you know, it's not the task of lawyers and judges to design a new legislative scheme, um, but that case could say, you know, Parliament has to design a new one now. Oh, okay, let me pick one of those provisions you just talked about and put that to Monty. Could you live with a new law? Could you live? I mean, mm -hmm. would you find it acceptable to live with a new law uh, which does say segregation is allowed, but there's a limit on how long you can put a prisoner in segregation, and you have to tell that prisoner when it is. You okay with that? Can I live with it? I can live with it. Again, if you put the resources and you deal with the capacity and the infrastructure, you deal with all those issues, absolutely I can live with it. Which is out of your hands, I guess, right? Those well, are all political decisions. Well, I, I advocate with, uh, with our... our uh, um, elected officials, so I meet with our minister when I can, and uh, I propose, uh, you know, what I think is, uh, would be acceptable alternative, and hopefully they listen. Gotcha. Lee, uh, you know, one of the reasons this uh, captured so much attention in Ontario is Adam Capay's case in Thunder Bay, where we were told he spent, what was it, four years in segregation? His is not the only uh, quite desperate story we heard, and I was hoping to prevail upon you to tell us about a woman named Julia Bellotta. Is that her name? Julie Bellotti. Uh, Bellotta, yes. Okay. What happened to her? Well, it was horrible circumstances, and, and certainly this was, um, it triggered a review in 2012. The then Minister of the Day, um, uh, Minister Mayor, uh, promised a full review, and that was a, a Bob Cook health care review that entailed. She was admitted at nine months pregnant. Somehow that was undetected. It when, was undetected? She was nine months pregnant? She was going through labor. Um, she was in pain and screaming and... And, and in solitary? Well, no, she was moved to solitary because she was a disturbance. And oh. she was being allowed and, and, and so essentially, and this is all public record, um, unfortunately there wasn't any thought toward the fact that she could be giving birth. She was moved to segregation to get out put out of the way of others so that they couldn't hear her screaming. Uh, to the point, and there's some graphic stuff here, and I'm not entirely sure, but I guess I will share it. Um, there was blood involved in a, in a foot of her baby, and, and the first thought was that was contraband. Uh, not, and, and it was a really unfortunate happenstance. It was egregious, and one of, one of the very few cases that really points to, um, it's one of the really, and again, this triggered a report and it triggered a lot of different things that uh, dating back to 2012, that's when this occurred. Uh, there was also Christina John and, and the John remedies, and there's just been so many of these things over the course of the last five or six well, years. we need to complete that story. The baby died. Yes. Her G baby died. Gianni did die. Okay, let's go back to Lisa, and I think we need to, in our remaining moments here, we need to get some better understanding of if solitary uh, is too problematic for some of the reasons that you've explained, uh, we need some better alternatives. So Lisa, have you got any better ideas you can share with us right now? Well, I'm just, you know, that's such a devastating, appalling story that, um, that Lee just told us about. And I think it's a good example of how there needs to be a clear rules in legislation um, you know, this report in Ontario, it talks about how the policies that govern segregation aren't sometimes even publicly available, right? They're not even posted on the website. They're not even available to the public or to inmates who are segregated. Um, there's no prohibition in our legislation on the placement of a pregnant woman in a segregation cell. Um, obviously, a wildly inappropriate place for prenatal care. Um, you know, the risk of her going into into labor, 
um, obviously a wildly inappropriate place for someone who um, has recently given birth. And so these, these basic protections, which I really don't think any reasonable person disagrees with, um, you know, those aren't in our law right now. And when they are in the law, when there's time limits and prohibitions and all these appropriate things, it will require corrections to ask for resources and to reorganize and to train staff differently. Um, it will be a bit of a burden on them. Um, but in my view, it's an, it's an appropriate burden. And it may actually be that um, correctional officers um, have, a, have an improved uh, workplace. Um, if these limits are, are implemented in law and if the institution has to change as a result. Lee, I see you trying to get in. Yeah, yeah, my thought there, and I agree with everything Lisa just said, certainly, and I was a little uh, moved when I was sharing that. It was difficult for me to put out, but, but one of the things that I can point to is the oversight in Ontario has been remiss for a long time. Uh, Andre Moren's tenure from 2005 when he came in as the Ontario Ombudsman shut down what was called the corrections team. There has been no on-site presence from oversight body. Howard Saper's report, I'm, I'm impressed. It's the first time we can point to data. It's the first time you've been able to, or anybody has been able to look at, at statistics and break down pie charts and say, here's where things are and here's where the issues are, systemic issues. The Ombudsman Act gives tremendous power to the Ontario Ombudsman Office, and I believe they've played a big role in why this has uh, continued to be now, problematic. Moran, Moran is not here to defend himself, so do you have any explanation as to why he did that? Well. They, they put together a sort team, which was based upon, you know, a, a major investigative unit to uh, investigate um, uh, big issues. But essentially it's become, and they also closed all their satellite offices and operate as a call center out of downtown Toronto, the only office. Uh, the, the provincial, Ontario Provincial Corrections has no complaint process internally for inmates, unlike the federal system. The Office of the Correctional Investigator I can point to as a comparison really quickly to say last year's annual report tabled to Parliament and publicly available for all Canadians provides a real lens into the issues uh, existent in the federal system. Do we need that for Ontario? We do. 370 days cumulatively was spent on site by investigators, 2200 interviews in person were conducted. Uh, Ontario Provincial Corrections has limited communication abilities, even to get to a phone often. Um, without this on-site presence, without the ability for inmates to be able to speak with, and without even our ombudsman or oversight body having any sense of what a jail, the, the actual infrastructure I is about, I think is a real glaring... Monty, I'm down to my last 30 seconds here and I want to ask you this. You know, we all use the healthcare system. Most of us at some point have some dealings with the education system in the province. I could go on. Very few of us have any direct connection to the correction system, thankfully. Since that's the case, how do you get the public seized adequately of this issue to put in some of the reforms we've talked about here today? Well, first, appearing on TVO, the agenda is a, is a start, but uh, we've gotten more positive press in the last few years in getting out the issues. Uh, and I think there has been a dynamic change where the public is uh, taking more interest. Um, I just want to touch on, on the last few seconds, uh, Mr. Saper said that basically the inmate living conditions are our working conditions. And that's important to recognize that if we improve for the inmates, it's going to also improve uh, for the members that I represent and the conditions that I work in. And again, uh, getting that frontline input, uh, it's been uh, the ombudsman, Mr. Saper said, those were important aspects. And again, we need to speak with our frontline staff. Gotcha. I want to thank all of you for coming on TVO tonight and sharing your views on this. Lisa Kerr, the Queen's University Faculty of Law Professor. Monty Wieselmeyer from the Corrections Division of OPSU. Lee Chappelle, Canadian Prison Consulting. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.